Today is an important episode in which I'm going to expose the truth about what really happens behind major corporations and trillion dollar asset management funds and big bankers like Goldman Sachs. The hard truth is, is that they are in this for themselves and they care about their bottom line. So what does that mean for us and our beloved Bitcoin going forward? Here's just one insight into what happens behind the scenes and behind what they're telling you on the news. Goldman Sachs played the classical, stereotypical, caricature role of the greedy banker that seeks only to maximize his profits regardless of the cost to society or the world at large. You like those two years now, huh? Cash. Yeah, cash, cash. Institutionally, at Goldman Sachs, bad for the client isn't a phrase. All right, we have a 24 bid now for 12 to 13. Institutionally, at Goldman Sachs, is, is it good for Goldman? Well, we wanted the funds for um, a one MDB, and as you know, a rather, you know, in a way seduced by the name of Roman Sachs. We think Roman Sachs is the, you know, the, the gold standard in terms of bank. You never imagined that they would do something uh, nefarious, so something illicit, or something unethical. But I'll also explain why there's hope, thanks to crypto industry leaders on the forefront of this movement, like Brad Garlinghouse of Ripple, who took the SEC head on in the case SEC versus Ripple and XRP, or Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong, who is set to go against the SEC this Wednesday in court. And they are visionary leaders in this space, along with Charles Hoskinson. Man, Charles Hoskinson for president. Comment down below if you agree with me. That man is such an iconic leader and his face is there. How many founders, how many projects have founders that are spearheading this movement like Charles Hoskinson and putting themselves out there time and time again? Not many. So I'm going to go over also what happened when I decided to bet on Cardano last cycle that led to 65x gains and why I believe you could earn generational wealth by adding Cardano as one of your foundational portfolio coins in this episode. And as Charles Hoskinson puts it, you know, it doesn't really matter at that point what the Europeans, the Americans or others say, because they'll just basically be outcompeted. Either they change or die. I'll also be going over the Bitcoin charts briefly and where Bitcoin is set to head in the next two to four months, how this time isn't actually all that different from other times, which is a good thing, as well as the reasoning behind Vanguard choosing not to offer the spot Bitcoin ETF to their clients, how that's affecting the market and the reaction from the clients, which is actually a first. And just before we get started, I wanna congratulate one of the crypto making community members who watched my last video and won $5,000 because he minted his address on the blockchain via Proppy, who is revolutionizing the real estate industry. He did what I said. I told you guys, hey, we're getting close. The number 1,000 to mint their address will win $5,000 in pro tokens. So congratulations, Wit. And you can now have a second chance to win that 5,000 by being number 5,000 to mint your address on the blockchain through Proppy. And the link is in the description below. So good luck. And I'll be bringing things like this to you on my YouTube as frequently as possible. So make sure you tune into the end and share this with people. Like and subscribe. So we push this out to more viewers because I'm working hard to bring you the truth and quality content that is going to help you succeed in these markets and make generational wealth. So without further ado, I'm your host, Megan Nilsson, aka Crypto Megan, tuning in from sunny southern Spain. And let's get right into it. To kick this episode off, I want to delve into exactly what is going on behind the scenes to follow up on the clip you saw in the intro that's actually from a Netflix documentary called Man on the Run. It is actually really interesting and it it really shows you the kind of corruption that's been going on in the traditional finance world for decades. And so one of the things that Tim Draper says on our podcast is the reason why he thinks his price target of $250,000 Bitcoin did not hit by 2020. 
2023 was that he didn't anticipate how hard Web2, the financial world and the dollar would fight to maintain its power. And one of the things Tim Draper said on our last podcast is that he didn't anticipate how hard they would fight to keep the dollar in power. And their tradi- and he didn't anticipate that the traditional finance world would rally so hard against this asset coming to fruition and kind of taking over. So let's watch this video about what happened with Goldman Sachs back in the day and how that reflects on what's going on in the world today. Goldman is the 400 pound gorilla of Wall Street. It is one of the most storied and powerful banks in the world. They're an investment bank. They make their money by advising clients on financial transactions, everything from a merger and acquisition to raising capital, and then to buying and selling securities on behalf of other investors. Thank you for the invitation to appear before you today as you examine some of the causes and consequences of the financial crisis. To be betting against the very securities which you're selling to your clients and internally your own people believe that these are crappy securities. The bad news in your own words was that your clients lose money, but the good news is that Goldman Sachs made money. Obviously very disconcerting. We're but you still got fined. Well, we got fined, but if you look, you know, everybody got fined. Right. And we got fined for... Yeah. To my knowledge, none of the directors lost their jobs. It was sort of a reset, and on we go. Sorry about that. We promise we won't do it again. So this is just to further illustrate my point about how deeply seated this corruption is in the traditional finance world, and we just have to turn a blind eye and move on. In fact, it reminds me a lot of a speech that Charles Hoskinson gave uh, while he was kind of worked up about the way that the traditional finance and the government and the SEC is influencing crypto. You know, everything is about to change and the old ways are dying, but they're just trying so hard to grip on to this old corrupt system and to keep their pockets lined and to resist this change. And it's it's just it's stifling the innovation in the US. So let's have a look at this clip again from Charles Hoskinson. I played it on one of my previous episodes on Cardano. Uh, This guy, Charles Hoskinson, is just, he's just an iconic leader. He really is. He really stands for everything that is good within the space and everything we're fighting for so hard that's on the other side of this. Take a look. Continue. And then at some point, it'll stop. There will not be an apology. There's not going to be any money that comes back. And we'll just move on like we did with the Kennedy assassination. We'll just move on, like we did with Vietnam. We'll just move on, like we did with Iraq and Afghanistan. We'll just move on, like we're doing right now with COVID. We'll just move on, like we did with all the things that have happened the last 50, 60, 70 years in the United States history. It has to stop. So there it is. I mean, it sounds exactly like what he, what the guy is saying in the documentary. We just move on. We're expected to put our blinders on and trust what's happening and just move on and not ask questions. But you know what? Those days are done. Those days are numbered and they know it and they're threatened by it. I mean, we're facing the change of an entire world order and it starts here with our grassroots community, as Tim Draper put it, because we are the ones policing this movement. We are the ones helping each other because the SEC doesn't have our back. <laughs> we have to protect ourselves from the SEC, essentially, which is insane. So, I just wanted to start the episode off with this somewhat somber tone because this is what new people see when they get in. They watch the news, they listen to the government, and that's where they get their information. And they're being constantly manipulated, which you'll see later on in the episode as I give you more examples of this manipulation happening throughout the entire course of the, you know, traditional finance history. So now we have a chance to change that. And that's why this movement is so significant.
So here's the infamous chart that I've shown on when I invested in Cardano in the last bear market in February, actually one month from now, was the absolute best time to buy altcoins last cycle, or one of the best times. I mean, it was a period of time, right, leading up into the halving and even after the halving because Cardano didn't take off for about a year after I bought it. But just I want to set the tone again by by stressing how important this movement is. There are people stuck in the wheel, caught in the rat race, and they have a chance to get out of it now. Just imagine if you had worked for the last 50 years, a nine to five job, slave to the system, and suddenly throughout these years, they increased the money supply by 40%, printing money into oblivion, and you lose the equivalent of 20 years worth of your hard work and you lose 40% purchasing power due to the inflation plus taxes added on top of that, the average person doesn't stand a chance. No wonder the average person is left always trying to catch up and to get by and to keep up. But what if there was a way out? What if they could finally be free? That is what we are fighting for here. That is what is so important and what propels you to get up out of bed every single day and help you guys and teach you guys about this movement because we have the chance to be free. But it goes well beyond being financially free. You'll earn transparency. The space will be equitable. Things will be more balanced in the world. There will be new jobs created and basically elevating human existence as we know it, democratizing society. That is the power of blockchain. So that's enough for my rant for today, but please do, if you like this message, smash the subscribe button, hit the like, and share this with as many people as possible because I'm working hard to bring you these episodes so that we can all take maximum advantage of this general generational wealth opportunity that we have this cycle and next cycle and how to maximize it the most, to, to get the most out of it. So here we have my Cardano charting here. Um, from when I bought it, just under five cents back in February 29th, 2020, when Bitcoin was at $9,000. I bet there's a lot of us that would kill to go back to $9,000 price to buy Bitcoin now. But that chance is gone. The chance to buy Cardano at five cents is gone. But here we are again with another opportunity. And I just want to go over this again because it's powerful. So I invested at just under five cents. A $500 investment then would have led to $30,000 at the top of that bear market. And that was within the span of about a year. I mean, that's insane. And that's not something that we should expect or, you know, invest hoping for as an outcome. But when I invested in Cardano, I knew that it had the potential to stand the test of time and that there was a solid foundation underneath it and an even more solid team behind it. So I didn't know how high it could go, but I knew that I was betting on the future. Future. And that's how you win in this space. So let's have a look here. I know you can't see it because my video is here, but 1,000 would have led to 62,000. Uh, 10,000 would have led to over half a million, 624,000 at the top of last cycle. So let's carry that over and um, just take a look at the power of compounding and holding over the years. Just set it and forget it, making this simple. So if I were to have kept some of that, which I did, I did not sell all of it, but I did sell a lot of it around the $3 mark. At the top of this cycle, if Bitcoin hits up to $10, sorry, Cardano, it's up to $10, like I know that it can in a blow off top, maybe even beyond that. I mean, Cardano is, is set to explode based on what's being built, the total value locked and everything that's happened since last cycle and all the evolution in the building and the process. Uh, the gains from that $500 investment would be the equivalent of $104,000. If ADA goes to $10 and I still held that bag of ADA that I bought at five cents, just imagine that. I mean, that's what I mean by generational wealth. This is not a lot of money for a lot of people. Just set it aside and forget it and and let it ride. And it's not financial advice, but this is how you win in this market. And let's see, $1,000 would be 200,000, 5,000 would be 1 million and 10,000 invested last cycle at that point would be $2 million. That's life-changing money, guys. And now we're at the, pro the point that we could do it again. I'm going to show you this chart, Car Cardano chart again till I'm blue in the face. Every time I talk about Cardano, I have to show it because it's powerful. I bought Cardano right here in this circle. The halving, sorry, right here where this arrow is. The halving was right here in May 2020. Um, and, you know, it took a year, about a year of sideways price action, a little bit less until Cardano started its 
massive ascent. But as you can see here, it took off and it waited for no one. So what I also like to say is these massive moves happen only several times per year. So if you're not in the coin when that happens, you miss it period. And that is why we don't time the markets. We just look for generally good market opportunities, which in my opinion is right now, again, for Cardano. So here we are. I started talking about it at 28 cents in my daily videos to Bitcoin having countdown in October. And since then, we went all the way up to 67 cents. And now we're currently around the 53 cent mark. And these were my price targets at the time. We blew right through all of them. And now we're currently right around this top price target. And as you can see here, um, I charted out that from that 26 cents, $6 for Cardano would be a 23X, $8 would be a 30X. And we're now a little bit higher than that. But again, I believe Cardano could even wake up to $10 this cycle uh, and $30 in the next cycle, right? Like this is just compounding And this. If I believe in my thesis that Cardano is going to be one of the top 10 coins to stand the test of time, then, you know, this is in my foundational pillar for my life-changing generational wealth that I'm going to accumulate over these cycles. And that's how you become successful. You accumulate over the cycles in the generally good areas to buy. <laughs> There's no one price point that's a good area to buy. You just try to get it in general and you set it and forget it. That has been my winning strategy and taking profits, of course. So moving right along, we have some Bitcoin charts to go over here just to recap where we're at with Bitcoin. We are, this is a chart, a four hour chart um, on Binance, and it is just showing that we are currently what's looking like retesting the 200 simple moving average at the time of recording, which would be a bearish retest if it were to do that. If we could get it to break above this point of control, which is about 43,600 and then above 45,000, 45,500, then we're off to the races again and we could see a potential rise up to 55,000. But until then, if this is a bearish retest, we've got some price targets around 40,000 is a big level support and then on down to 35,000. And here in this next chart, you can see a little bit better that what would be a really incredible outcome and would show that b the more things change, the more they stay the same. And although we're unlocking this massive liquidity, Bitcoin is still set up and primed to follow what's happened in, in previous cycles. And typically, Bitcoin hasn't pumped to reach past its all-time high until after the halving. So it would be completely normal to be range-bound from now to the next two to four months. And our range right now is looking anywhere from, you know, the $40,000 to right around where we are now, $43,000 mark, up to the 0 spot 0.618 FIB, which is right around where we wicked up to, the $48,000, $49,000 resistance zone, which I said pre-Bitcoin ETF approval that this is going to be a massive zone of resistance and we very well may not get above this until after the halving. And here we are. Let's see what happens now. If we were to get above this massive level of resistance, then we could see a um, a quick shoot up to the 0 0.786, 0 spot 0.786 FIB level, which is between 57 dollars and $58,000. So that's currently what I'm looking at for Bitcoin. But you guys know, I'm not really looking for Bitcoin at these levels. I'm looking for my altcoin entries. So uh, I'm keeping an eye on those and I'm going to make some really good videos this week on bull market trends and the top coins I believe will dominate those trends. So stay tuned for that. And here we have just a little bit of fun because these episodes, this one is a little bit heavier, but I like to, to do something lighthearted. It's when you're trying to explain crypto to some newcomer and you think it's super easy because you've mastered it and you understand it and you're telling it and you're like, wow, they're really going to get it. And they don't. It's not that hard, Scott. Tell them, watch. It's incredibly hard. <laughs> so, you know, this is to remind you that we are a small minority right now and we are the early adopters. So until that Steve Jobsian moment happens where everything is done at the click of a button and is easy, we may not see those meteoric astronomic price targets like, you know, $500,000 to $1 million Bitcoin. It is coming. It's an if not one thing. But it may just take a little bit longer than we anticipate due to all these factors of, you know, mass adoption and how it happens. But it will happen. I fully believe so. So that is my conviction. And I'm playing these markets as such. And um, so this is what people see on the news, which is interesting because this is one of the narratives floating around that, you know, wow, this Bitcoin spot ETF, it's the safer way to hold your Bitcoin. It's actually 
completely not true, and we all know that, although it is the easier way and it's a necessary good step forward, it's interesting to see how the media spins it because, you know, it's like we already forgot about what happened with Celsius and Voyager and, and other, you know, crypto platforms that went bankrupt and people lost their money. But let's check it out. For a cleaner way to own it, it transformed gold 20 years ago. You and I were around, Tyler, for the gold ETF in 2004. A lot of people used to own gold in gold bars and gold coins in their basement. And all of a sudden, you didn't have to do that. There was a custodian to hold it for you. And that's what's going on with the Bitcoin ETF. There's now a custodian, Coinbase is the custodian for a lot of this, uh, that holds it. And they're the ones that are responsible. If you don't forget your passport, you don't lose it, they hold it for you. So that's. So they are the ones responsible, huh? Think again. If they go bankrupt, you lose your money, not your keys, not your crypto, period. It is not the pure way to hold it. It's not the pure way at all. In fact, some may argue that why would you pay a fee to have somebody else buy your Bitcoin and hold it for you? It seems absurd. But it does give the masses access. It gives people access who want to put it in their retirement account, who need it at the click of a button, who need that regulatory infrastructure in order to be able to invest legally. So it is a very big step and in many ways a necessary step in the evolution and the adoption of crypto. Um, so we're going to go on down the line and then hear why Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, believes this is such a monumental occasion. They're all a little bit different perspectives. Let's check this one out. In the technological revolution in the financial markets, step two is going to be the tokenization of every financial asset. And to me, this is where we believe it's going. So we're looking at uh, Bitcoin, we're looking at ETFs in the same manner. These are technological changes that can allow us to move forward. As I said, these are just start stepping right. stones towards tokenization. And I, I really do believe this is where we're going to be going. We have the technology to tokenize today. If you want to talk about, think about this. If you had a tokenized a security and you have a tokenized identity, right. you, Andrew, the moment you buy or sell an instrument, it's known. It's on a general ledger right. that is all created together. Um, you want to talk about issues around money laundering and all that. This eliminates all corruption by having a tokenized system. Jamie Dimon disagrees with you. Wow. I mean, hearing those words out of BlackRock, well, the face of BlackRock, Larry Fink's mouth, who has $10 trillion under asset, under management, assets under management, basically controls and runs the whole world, financial, financially speaking, I mean, to a certain extent, is arguing that this is the end-all be-all to end corruption. And we have the head of our SEC saying exactly the opposite, that Bitcoin promotes corruption and nefarious characters and money laundering. So it's interesting to see that he is kind of taking a stance there in his own way, against the SEC, because now it is in his interest, in his best interest and in BlackRock's best interest. And you know what? It's good for us. So for now, BlackRock is our friend. And it's very cool to hear them talk about, you know, this is just the first step in the tokenization of everything, because that is true, what he is saying. That does bring total transparency back to the system. And and it's it's kind of like the new order is starting to fall in line. And so it's interesting that he's He's referring to the Bitcoin ETF as a first step toward technological advances in, you know, updating the system. It is time to update the system. And next up, we're going to hear from CEO of Coinbase, Brian Armstrong, who's actually going up in court, going in court up against the SEC this week for, you know, allegations they're being sued for by the SEC, which is insane. And yet they are going to be the custodians that are responsible for all our money, according to the news anchor. So there's a lot of weird stuff happening and a lot of kind of stuff that doesn't seem to make sense. And that is the manipulation of it all. Let's hear what Brian Armstrong has to say about the Bitcoin ETF. This is a monumental step for the crypto industry and for Coinbase too. And the reason is that Look, there's 52 million Americans who have been using crypto over the past decade. And I think they've been hungry for some kind of acknowledgement from government and the SEC in particular that 
this asset class is here to stay. And they finally got that. So what a monumental moment. You know, we finally got that. And it's not that we need that that outside validation in the space. It's just that we're that much closer to being able to, you know, get this adopted by the world. I mean, these are the necessary steps that we must have in society. And so that is one of the reasons it's such a monumental occasion. Now we're going to investigate what is going on in the race to become the top of the Bitcoin ETF tier. Who is going to get the lion's share of the market? I know we've got a lot of ads coming out from all different Bitcoin ETFs, and it's interesting to see what is happening, particularly Vanguard pulling out of the Bitcoin ETF race, and we're going to go over that now. So here we have Justin, BlackRock now holds 11,439 Bitcoin worth over 497 million for their spot Bitcoin ETF. That's pretty, pretty big, pretty big. And then Justin, $7.7 trillion asset manager Vanguard removes Bitcoin future ETFs from its platform and has reportedly been barring people from purchasing, buying in on the Bitcoin ETF. So what is going on here? Why this kind of move, this anti-crypto stance going back in time, it just doesn't make sense. And speaking of the tokenization of assets, like I said in my intro, we had one viewer of my YouTube channel win $5,000 by participating in what I was describing on my last YouTube as the race to number 1,000 to mint your address on the blockchain with Proppy, a leading company in real estate and RWA play. They are taking a real estate industry by storm and congratulations on that. So they are all about this. Tim Draper is actually invested in Proppy and it is, you know, one of my top plays for this up and coming bull run. Um, so you can now win $5,000 by being number 5,000 to mint your address on the blockchain. And it's super simple. The link is in the description below. So check it out. Also, the access codes will be in the description and I hope you win. So as we continue here, we have this breaking news. Bank of America owned Merrill Lynch joins Vanguard in denying customers access to spot Bitcoin ETFs. I mean, this is kind of insane. It's like one domino to make them all fall toward the dying dinosaur old ways of the world. I don't I really it's very hard to make sense of this all. There's one theory that I have, which I'll go over with you toward the end of this. But um, it's just it's very discouraging to see them take this anti crypto stance and be on the wrong side of history. Justin Vanguard, the world's second largest asset manager behind BlackRock, has banned all customers from buying into the Bitcoin spot ETFs. The firm says that these products don't fit with Vanguard's investment philosophy. And this really gets under my skin. And actually, if you guys watch Ivan on tech, um, I just I love Ivan and his whole attitude toward the space. And he's saying, like, what do they actually provide? What is their actual philosophy? They are a platform, a website that allows you to purchase these assets. Nothing more. <laughs> That's it. So the fact that they're saying that it doesn't fit their investment philosophy is insane. What they really should say is it's not good for our bottom line. That's what they should really say here, because that's all they care about. So but how could that be true and why? Well, one of my theories was Kevin O'Leary recently said in, in the video that I played in the last YouTube that he thinks that most of the Bitcoin spot ETFs will flop and that they'll all kind of consolidate into the top one or two. And that's it. What doesn't make sense, though, is that Vanguard is the world's second largest asset manager and there's more. Here it says, the Vanguard Group owns 8.2% of MicroStrategy, the second largest of all holders. Somehow, they find issues with Bitcoin's ETF. What this tells you is worse than Vanguard not liking Bitcoin. It tells you that they are either liars, charlatans, who haven't done their research, or both. And here we have it, Vanguard and their share in MicroStrategy. They also own a bunch of other publicly traded Bitcoin-focused entities, top five holders, so they're Purported anti-Bitcoin stance is questionable. They also allow gold funds to be held at Vanguard accounts, which the CEO said they don't. Also, please stop trying to explain me explain to me that it's their funds who own it. That's my point. Complete hypocrisy. So here's yet another example of an institution 
barring their customers and and spinning a narrative anti-Bitcoin while they're on the other end somehow exposed to it in some way, shape, or form. Not like Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan that directly bought it. <laughs> and we'll go over that later in the, in the episode. I mean, there's just so many instances of manipulation and, you know, oh, discouragement of people trying to take advantage of these once in a lifetime opportunities. And, and it's really frustrating to see. And here we have my friend Fiddy <laughs> commenting, Merrill Lynch and Vanguard deny access to Bitcoin ETFs, failing to adapt to the new financial era, risking their future. And then we go back to what Charles Hoskinson said in the intro. This is a new era and you either change or die. That's it. There is no other option, in my opinion. The Vanguard, Vanguard runs $75 billion ETF with 30% exposure to China, but you're not allowed to invest in spot Bitcoin ETF. <laughs> Point here is that this 30% exposure to China is a very high risk play considering what's happening in China and the fallout of Evergrande and the real estate and all the stuff that's going on. And yet you can't buy into Bitcoin. You don't have a choice. And that's what this system has tried to implement for, for decades now, that they know better than you and you should just follow their lead. But look to where that is led. It's time to start opening your eyes and seeing the bigger picture. And I think everybody on this channel is here because you want to do so and you've been doing so. And I commend you for that. Here we have new $9 trillion asset manager BlackRock unveils a new spot Bitcoin ETF ad for boomers. It seems Larry Fink is hellbent on winning the ETF race against Virgin Vanguard. So they're appealing to boomers here. And they're trying to step up now, saying like, hey, if you're not into this or for some reason you don't want to dip your toes in this, we'll take the big lion's share of the cake here. And um, rest assured, it's not for the benefit of the boomers why they're fighting for this. But let's check out the commercial. Others as a potential game changer. In Digital asset adoption has significantly accelerated over the past decade with profound implications for the future of finance. Bitcoin is the original cryptocurrency to gain global adoption and has continued to maintain its dominance despite thousands of others coming into existence. You might have noticed Bitcoin make its way into our everyday lives, from Bitcoin ATMs to various merchants accepting Bitcoin as payment, further driving interest in what the future holds for the cryptocurrency. Investors have taken notice, as in institutions and individual investors alike have been adopting Bitcoin into their investment portfolios with some viewing it as a potential store of value and others as a potential game changer in how money moves around the world. But for many investors, holding Bitcoin directly can be complex. That's why we launched iBit, the iShares Bitcoin Trust, an ETF that provides investors convenient exposure to Bitcoin. Here are three things to know about iBit. Access. iBit enables investors to access Bitcoin within a traditional brokerage account just like stocks, bonds, and other ETFs. Convenience. iBit can help remove operational burdens associated with trading and holding Bitcoin directly, as well as potentially high trading costs and tax reporting complexities. Quality. iBit is built by BlackRock, a leading ETF firm with expertise across ETFs and a history of innovation. It is a new day for Bitcoin. Access iBit through your online brokerage, or discuss with your financial planner to find out how iBid can fit into your portfolio. So really interesting stance here and interesting how they chose to break down the benefits of Bitcoin, not like have sovereignty over your money or be free or be financially free. It's like easy access and less trading fees. And but you know what? Like, maybe that is what gets the attention of the boomers and gets them starting to think differently. And if that is the case, then at least this is a good first step, but far from what crypto and Bitcoin was originally designed to do and what it is designed to do. Even so, interesting to see and very cool to see in a way that uh, could you ever have imagined that BlackRock was putting out an ad like this just a few years back?
Here we have, I don't use Vanguard Group, but my wife does. Since they have banned the Bitcoin ETFs, we have no choice but to move her retirement accounts over to Fidelity. It's really disgusting behavior from Vanguard. Let's go Fidelity. Then we have rumors starting that Vanguard Group are reconsidering their anti-Bitcoin stance after a mass exodus from their products last week. The power of X is a thing. That's this grassroots community, baby. We do have a say and we do have power together and it's it's fun to see. Like, let's see what happens because there's a lot, or like a lot going around on Twitter right now. Vanguard is losing customers by the boatloads because they won't allow their clients to buy the Bitcoin ETFs with their own money. Can you imagine the gal? You need their permission to buy something with your money. If they don't approve of what you're buying, you can't do it. Bitcoin fixes this. Look at Vanguard's corporate logo. That's the picture of their clients literally taking all their funds and sailing off somewhere else. That's a ship called Opportunity, sailing off and leaving these boomers behind. This will not age well at all. Stack harder. <laughs> the, I, I thought that was a really funny uh, kind of analogy for their their logo. And, and yeah, that's what it is. And that's what a CBDC is, by the way. It's taking control over what consumers can spend and what they can't spend and putting caps on things. And it's just, it's the same old tired system with better new technology and more control in place. Opt out. And here we have Justin. Kathy Wood says it's a terrible decision by Vanguard to deny their customers access to Bitcoin ETFs. They're going to deprive the investors, the first global decentralized private, no government oversight, rules based monetary policy, monetary system in history. Um, you said at the beginning that you hope that you will be one of the winners here. I mean, if you look out a year, five years from now, do you think there will be 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs? Do you think some of them will have closed? Um, I don't think there will be 11 spot uh, ETF, Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, some may close, some may be uh, consolidated into bigger companies. Uh, the more pure play uh, companies may be bought out by, uh, by the larger players who need, that, need more of that expertise in-house. So uh, I do think the process of closing and consolidation will take Take us down to, to three, maybe four, but more likely three. Interesting outlook here. So just like Kevin O'Leary, Kathy, uh, Kathy Wood is saying here that she thinks they'll be consolidated into three, three Bitcoin ETFs and uh, that they need that in-house in expertise. And it's it's a, just really cool times to be sharing this with you on YouTube, commenting on all these massive funds, $10 trillion under assets and management on our space. <laughs> it's just so fun to see. And here we have a really cool image of Vanguard and their big powerful ship and their steam stackers here, whatever they're called. And there we have us rowing here in this boat, rowing away against the stream, leaving Vanguard behind. Maybe it's like the Titanic, you know, it's just old and doomed. <laughs> no, really, though. I mean, it's, it's a powerful image and it, it makes you think like sometimes the best path in life oftentimes it's never the easy one, but it's the most satisfying and the most gratifying. So stay the course, guys. Stay the course. And here we have just an example of the hypocrisy and the desperate cling onto power from Gary Gensler. We've had this uh, video circulating for quite a while now, but I want to bring it back into the attention so people don't forget how Many times the traditional finance world and the government has flip-flopped on things, particularly Gary Gensler, and why it's so frustrating for the innovation and the people who are really trying to build something incredible in this space. And this this is this is the problem right here. You understand it. You taught at MIT. We already know in the US and in many other jurisdictions that three quarters of the market are not ICOs or not what would be called securities, even in the US, Canada and Taiwan, the three jurisdictions that follow something similar to the Howey test that we've talked about. Three quarters of the mar market is non-securities. It's just a commodity, a cash crypto. Um, so you'll hear debates about initial coin offerings and what's a security and what's not a security. Relevant, relevant and important debate, but for three quarters of the market, it's not particularly relevant as a legal matter. 
Oh my God, I just can't believe what I'm hearing. I can't believe what I'm hearing. Is this, is this the same Gary Gensler? I mean, he clearly didn't think things through, right? Like the internet is forever. <laughs> and um, I, clearly he didn't think that the banks would take over and, and he would be controlled by them. And then that would be his destiny, I guess. But um, three quarters of the market don't have to have that regulatory concern because they're non securities. They're commodities. Three quarters. I mean, how can you go back on a statement like this and be taken seriously, really? And it's so frustrating for people who are really building things incredible, like Cardano, for example. And speaking of Cardano, this is Charles Hoskinson's frustration on the matter. In a commodity, anybody at any time could wake up and say, you know what? I'm going to grow some wheat. You know, to, to show, to argue that every single thing is a security. If if the founders all die and the protocol still operates and runs and the value of it is based upon the efforts of a collective of thousands, if not tens of thousands of independent people, how is that a security? We already have a term for that. It's called a commodity. If you kill any person on the planet, any person at all, the value of gold, regardless that's a CEO of barracks or the owner of the largest gold mine in the world, is still going to be there. Why? Because gold, its value is a collective of a marketplace. And the participation of these things are permissionless. Who comes to me and asks, can I build on Cardano? You have to ask Microsoft to do something with their products. You have to sign their licenses to do something with their products. It's centralized. But in a commodity, anybody at any time can wake up and say, you know what? I'm going to grow some wheat. You know what? I got some gold over there. I'm going to take it and sell it in a global marketplace. That's why the CFTC exists. Kind of makes sense, right? These are open protocols. But then they come in and say it's a security. Okay, well, what the hell does that mean if it's decentralized? How, how does Bitcoin register? Oh, but it's not. Then explain to me the fucking difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum and Cardano and the rest of the game. Explain it to me. Like I'm five years old. Run the goddamn Howie test on it and show me the difference between the two. Tell me, is there an expectation of return with the goddamn orange pill moon boys? And they'll lose court case after court case as they already have and will continue. And then at some point, it'll stop. There will not be an apology. There's not going to be any money that comes back. And we'll just move on. Wow. Uh, I just get the chills listening to, to Charles because... Man, I just feel like if he could sit in a room with Gary Gensler and, you know, everybody who ha who doesn't have this clear, it could be so, like, like, it's crystal clear to me after listening to, to two minutes of Charles Hoskinson talk. I don't know about you guys. Let me know in the comments. What do you think about this? We're currently at a war, we're at a crossroads. And for some reason, the, <laughs> the strategy of the SEC seems to be let's drain them. Let's suck them dry until like there's no money left for them to fight us back. And, you know, cripple their project and stifle all innovation. I mean, I, it seems to be like, like the path that they're following and it's really sucks to see. So it's, it's cool to see somebody of Charles stature stand up to that. And we need more of that. We need more of that. We need more sense to be made. We, we need different leadership that, you know, like maybe like uh, Tim Draper says, like in the times of the internet with Bill Clinton, let it rip. Let the markets decide. Let it settle. But no more hypocrisy. No more intentionally stifling innovation. Let's try to, to let this beautiful new technology flourish. So on that note, we've seen what the ad was for baby boomers buying into the Bitcoin ETF with BlackRock. And now I want to finish on a little bit lighter note in a forward-looking, hopeful tone for the future. And what the building blocks of our future may look like. This one is geared toward millennials and it's from Coinbase under Brian Armstrong's leadership. And this one I felt was, it was just really interesting. I really liked it. I feel like it really hits home and that this was, this is what this movement is truly about. And this does appeal to people that I described in the beginning. And basically, you know, everyone with a nine to five job and everyone who's still stuck in the other system. And it's time now for a change. We were born into a system. A system with numbers and papers. Lies and waiting. You work hard, get good grades, go to college. I went to college. 
I got good grades. I overachieved. That's what I actually did. Debt is good? Yeah. It's so good. So much debt. I can totally save up and buy a house and start a family. I want a family. Oh. Starting a family means you need two or three jobs. You can't afford to buy. Oh. You can't afford to buy. Used cars cost as much as the new ones. Oh. Good dad. I was ahead of my classes of two or six. The grades go The system did not. Rent is freaking insane. Breaking news. Everything is terrible. Does it have to be this way? What if it was different? It's always been that way. We've got to build our way out of it. Yeah. Who can go back in the hands of the people? The system that lets people work. No waiting. They're missionless. Just because you're born into a system? Doesn't mean you have to live with it. Wow. That is so powerful. That gave me the chills. And just that last phrase, just because you were born into a system doesn't mean you have to live with it. It's time to update the system and it's time for change. And that starts right here with you and I and our message that we want to spread to the world. So thank you so much for tuning in today. On that note, and I'll see you tomorrow.